Thank you, everyone. I see 23 people on this screen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are really excited and honored to be sharing these experiences with you. My name is Robin. I'm a board member of RARE and also the chair of the Open Discussion Committee. And we've had quite the hiatus with open discussions. We haven't had one since last summer. So this is a beginning, a new beginning for us. And we're very excited to be starting up with open discussions again. So uh, just to give you a little introduction, we're, we will start with Alan, another board member who's going to read our land and labor acknowledgement. And then Bruce, another board member, is going to introduce you to the panelists and the moderator. And then I'll come back and give you just a little bit of, of flow for how this, the format of the meeting will go. And then we'll get into the good stuff. Hey, Alan? Oh, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, before I even start to read this, I have to acknowledge Robin, who organized to put a lot of work into this whole format. So Robin, let's give Robin a hand. And, and for showing up, everybody, and, and panelists, and so forth and so on. So hey, this is a, I, I'm, I'm really excited for this whole session. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, Land and Labor Acknowledgement. We would like to show our respect and acknowledge the Puget Sound Coast Salish people, past and present, on whose lands we gather today. The Suquamish Tribe and Muckleshoot Indian Tribe are the federally recognized Indian tribes of Greater Seattle under the treaties of Point Elliott and Medicine Creek. In recognizing this history and respecting the sovereignty of Washington's Indian nations, RARE honors the heritage of indigenous communities and their significant role in shaping the course of this region. Further, we respectfully acknowledge the millions of enslaved Africans who provided exploited labor on which this country was built with little or no recognition. Similarly, we acknowledge the labor of other peoples who, while not enslaved, were exploited and who labor also contributed to the building of America. Uh, with that said, I'd like to pass the baton to Bruce Johnson. Hey, thanks, Alan, and nice job. Um, okay, our, I'm gonna introduce our panel. We have a great panel. Um, the first is our moderator, Professor Lilani Nishimi. She is a professor of communications at the University of Washington and the grants manager for the Seattle Asian American Film Festival. Her research interests are Asian American media, gender, and technology. Her book, Undercover Asian, Multi, Undercover Asian, Multi-Racial Asian Americans in Visual Culture is published by University of Illinois Press. And I hope I got your name right, uh, Leilani. Um, and then going from our youngest to our most senior panel member, is uh, is um, starting with is Quincy uh, Purcell, a current senior at Roosevelt High School. After graduation in June, he will be off to Case Western you know, uh, University in Cleveland, Ohio. Quincy is actively involved in racial equity movements at RHS and acts as a student ambassador for RARE. He was featured in the documentary uh, RHS and uh, RHS Beyond Black and White. And I, I've been to presentations of this film with Quincy has been a, a, on the panel and it, 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 he's been great uh, and really appreciate his um, volunteering his time like that. Also on the panel is Jessamine Young, a Senate second generation RHS graduate, as am I and a few other people in this audience, second generation. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees from Loyola University in New Orleans. She is now back in Seattle pursuing a career in broadcasting and writing. Um, Teshka Hatch is a rare board member and actively serves on other committees. She currently works at Equal Opportunity Schools, advocating for Black and Brown students to have equitable access to advanced coursework. And our most senior member is the, is the fabulous Teresa Stovall. She's an author, blogger, podcaster, and award-winning journalist specializing in intersectional identities. She's a Seattle native living in Atlanta. 
and a graduate of Roosevelt High School and the Evergreen State College Tacoma program. Grace's latest book is her mixed memoir, Swirl Girl, Coming of Race in the USA, which I read and enjoyed. That's our panel. Thank you, Bruce. I'm just gonna lay out a couple of things we want to keep in mind uh, while we have this, this session. I want you to be aware that this is being recorded. So this will be on the RARE website pretty quickly. So if in two weeks or two months or, or a year and a half, you want to have someone view this, you'll be able to find it on the RARE website. And in just a moment, I will put the RARE website in the chat so that you'll have that handy. Please note that all participants except for tonight's speakers are going to be muted. So this will eliminate distractions and background noise. You will be able to ask questions uh, using the chat, which is that little bubble down at the bottom of your screen. If you type the chat in, or you, I'm sorry, if you type your question in the chat, then um, Leilani Nishime will be able to read it. You can read it as well, but she'll read it out loud and then direct it to the panel or panelists if it, if it applies to just one person. Um, please keep your questions brief and in fairness to everyone, no multi-part questions. We might find that we're at the end of the session and you thought of something you wanted to say, a statement or a question or something to share. And if that happens, please go to the RARE website to contact us and type in your question there and someone from the open discussion committee will answer you as quickly as possible. And hopefully it will be a, the pan, correct panelist if you if you've directed it to one specific person. So with that, we are going to have all of our panels, uh, starting with our moderator, give you five minutes of who they are and, and then we'll get to the really good stuff. Hi everyone, um, I'm Leilani Nishime and I think some of what I was gonna say has already been covered, so it should be pretty quick. Um, I'm a professor of communication at the University of Washington. Um, and I uh, was spent about 10 years in a Department of Ethnic Studies in Northern California. And before that, I got my PhD in English at the University of Michigan. So my research is mainly on Asian American media, both mainstream and alternative production. Um, I'm interested in science fiction uh, in particular, and also in gender and technology and the environment. So my book on mixed race Asian Americans was called Undercover Asian. Um, and I was mainly interested in that question of uh, why it is that we so rarely recognize um, mixed race Asian Americans as Asian American, as mixed race Asian Americans. And so I look at a number of different popular culture sites. I look at the Matrix movies and I look at uh, Tiger Woods publicity and I look at this art project called the Hoppe Project um, and think about what kinds of narratives are created that allow us to either see uh, mixed race Asian Americans as mixed race Asian Americans, or whether it kind of suppresses that kind of identity. Um, so one of my main points in the book is to try to reframe the question away from whether or not somebody looks mixed, to ask why we so often assume a monoracial identity, um, why that's the kind of default setting for most people. Uh, personally speaking, I identify as Japanese American. All four of my grandparents immigrated to Hawaii from Okinawa, and I was born in Los Angeles. I've been in uh, Seattle now for 14 years, and my eldest son graduated from Roosevelt High School about three years ago. All right, so I'm gonna pass it um, over now to Quincy. Hi everyone, I uh, hope you're doing well. I'm Quincy. Um, as, uh, as Bruce mentioned, I'm a senior at Roosevelt High School. Um, I was born and raised here in Seattle. Um, my dad is, uh, was born on the East Coast um, in Brooklyn, New York, and came here, met my mom. Uh, my mom was uh, born and raised in Seattle. Um, and so uh, my dad is, um, is African American. Uh, his parents were raised in Panama. Um, my mom's side is white, um, and they've been in Seattle for a while. Um, so I just wanted to talk, I guess, a little bit about my journey. You know, I'm only 18, but I do have some experiences I can talk about. Um, so just going like starting with growing up in elementary school, um, I went to the local school, Bryant, that's just up the street. Um, and, you know, very, uh, you know, 
like the like the neighborhood I live in, it's very white. And so it was, you know, naturally difficult trying to navigate looking different than other students. Um, but still, you know, wanting to do the same things, wanting to play sports, wanting to do all these fun things. Um, and so navigating that, and then that I've kind of realized also intersects a little bit with my stuttering, um, which I developed at a young age. Um, and it was really hard, uh, especially in elementary school, to um, to fit in with uh, having to overcome that. Um, and then moving on past elementary school, um, I went to the Bush School for middle school. It's a private school in uh, Madison Park. Um, it's a little farther, but really for me, um, the main thing with that was it wasn't really a step forward in the way that I still didn't really feel comfortable. It was kind of going from one bubble to another. Um, and so one specifically white privilege bubble, and it was really hard to connect with the um, the people in that neighborhood because I live so far away. So that was another barrier. Um, and then, you know, moving right into Roosevelt, um, you know, still having that bubble. So at this point, I've repeated the word bubble a lot. And so that's what I'm used to, you know, I'm accustomed to that. And so, you know, I'm doing pretty well, but that's only because I've had the experiences um, and I'm used to this, to feeling this privilege. Um, you know, so obviously at Roosevelt, you know, tons of issues, obviously, um, which uh, if you watch the film, uh, you might learn a little bit more about Roosevelt High School Beyond Black and White. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's all about Roosevelt. And then looking forward to the future, it's important to look forward to the future. Um, I'm excited for college. Um, I think I'm going to maybe be able to escape the bubble a little bit more um, that I was in. I, you know, pretty confident I will. Um, you know, Cleveland is pretty diverse, Case Western is diverse, they have lots of opportunities I can take advantage of to continue racial equity work, and more importantly, to find a community I feel included in, find people that look like me, find people that are interested in the same things I am, um, and so I'm really excited for that, so yeah, thank you very much. Ashika, do you want to go next? Um, uh, Jessamine? Uh, do you have a oh, hand? Up? Sorry, you're right. Justin, I was going to go next. No, you're good. Don't try to age you too much, Bruce. Um, but hi, my name is Jessamine. I tend to tell people it rhymes with specimen, but with a J, it kind of, you know, rolls off the tongue a little bit more smooth. And a little bit about me, born and raised um, in Seattle, Washington, fresh from the Central District, and a little bit about just my being. So my mom, her family is white. They have origins from good old Great Britain, but specifically Comox, Canada, to be exact. And so she came down to, her and her family came down to Everett. And from there, she landed at Seattle University where she pursued her BA in criminology and justice. And on my dad's side, his family comes from Brookhaven, Mississippi and New Orleans, Louisiana. And he's actually a first generation Seattleite. And so those two little upwards, let's just say they had fun in the nineties listening to Bobby Brown. And here I am with my three siblings. So um, a little bit about just my just view of who I am and having this mixed racial identity it actually began on the home front um it was very two different environments mom side white uh dad side black and so just navigating just my love languages and how I viewed relationships and how I was well received I always was kind of like a wallflower but also I would find just peace and solidarity of just connecting with certain family members and really just the power of one-on-one -on -one conversations and so for me, I really didn't realize I was like growing up in a mixed racial background until I started commuting um, from the Central District up to Eckstein Middle School and Roosevelt High School. And so when I hopped on that 48, it was like me and all the black kids on 23rd and Jackson uh, way too early in the morning. I mean, it was like 6.45. We were just up down all around. And so we would hop on the bus. And as I would take my ride just to North Seattle, you know, going through Capitol Hill, going through Montlake, going through University District and landing at Roosevelt, you could see everything change about the world. You could see how the neighborhoods would change, the cleanliness, the people who got on and off the bus would shift. And even where people sat on the bus, which fun fact, I studied sociology in undergrad. So I very much love looking at institutions, people and behavior. And so for me, I just 
became more heightened of like, okay, how do I occupy these spaces? And so my time at Roosevelt, it was more so passion driven. I love people. And so I found myself doing everything from serving in Black Student Union to being student body president my senior year to joining Latin Club, which was an excuse just to wear a toga and dress up like once every few years. And uh, I just found myself in the gray area, which is like relational management. That's where I found I could have the most impact when talking about what does racial equity look like, even as I'm still trying to come to terms with it. And so after my time at Roosevelt, like, like leading a couple marches here and there, because, you know, I always got to push back a little bit. Uh, I found my way down to the mighty state of Louisiana. And that's where I went to Lola University of New Orleans, which I chose that school uh, just because of the Jesuit values, which I'm not Catholic, but the Jesuits know how to get down when it comes to relation building. And so it was just beautiful how they talk about pure, like, pure personalis, caring for the full person. Like, what does it mean like to have integrity behind the work that you do? And so while I was down in New Orleans, to your point, Quincy, I'm so excited for your journey and college is absolutely going to explode in so many ways of having exposure, having people who look like you, having diversity, and also the people who look like you. So going from a predominantly white city, which is Seattle, to a predominantly black city in New Orleans, it was the most beautiful thing I could have asked for. And so there, that's where I began to feel more secure in my racial identity, occupying both those spaces, even though I'm obviously black presenting. And um, now just being back in Seattle, it's like having that confidence, having that standard is allowing me to occupy, you know, old spaces, but with the new power. So that is where I am right now, currently pursuing podcasting and, you know, all fun things that a 24 year old would do at this time. And yeah, that's a little bit about Specimen with a J. That's great. Yeah, college, I, I just brings back so many memories of being in college, you know. So, yeah, I'm excited for both of you uh, guys. Uh, it, it's going to be great, uh, exciting time. Uh, Teshka, you're up. Thank you. I feel like I, I don't know if I can follow that one. That was I was just laughing, smiling the whole time. Um, and I was trying to think of how to make my name rhyme, but I can't really. So my name is Teshka Hatch. Um, the way I talk about it is that it's uh, it looks like Tashika, but the I is silent, so two syllables. Um, name was supposed to be Jessica, but my Japanese grandfather couldn't pronounce it, so they just changed the Jap the the name Jessica into Teshka, which fits fits into the Japanese language. So um, I'll try to do my best to to give you a little bit of um, kind of a, a quick summary, I guess, of my life thus far, especially as a mixed race person. Um, and I, I think my identity of being mixed race. Um, came, uh, became very clear early on in my life. So I grew up in Beacon Hill. Um, and, uh, I should, I should mention that, um, uh, my, my dad is, is white. He grew up in North Seattle. So in, uh, Laura Hurst, Exxon Roosevelt. Um, and my dad was, or my mom was born and raised in Japan in Tokyo. So, um, grew up in a, in a bilingual family, um, multinational, multiracial, uh, multi-ethnic. Uh, and we ended up moving to Japan when I was eight years old. So I grew up in Beacon Hill around a lot of different, um, a lot of diversity. Um, didn't really understand what race was as an eight-year-old, but thought it was normal for to be around people that just look different. Um, there was a lot of mixed kids at my, at, at Beacon, at, at uh, Kimball Elementary. There were a lot of um, families of a lot of different races. Um, going to Japan, however, and uh, going to public school in Japan, I was definitely um, odd, I guess, or different, right? And it was the first time that I think I really learned about what difference looked like or meant, um, having people point at me or um, make jokes in the subway about, you know, us being like half and half. Um, so I think that was where I started to understand what it meant to be othered. Um, and then coming back to the to the U.S. four years later, so I was 12 years old, and I had lost my English at that point. So um, coming back to Seattle, my my dad decided that we that it would be best for us to move to the North End. Um, so that was an incredibly interesting experience, trying to not just navigate uh, relearning English, but also trying to navigate what it meant to be a non-white but partially white kid in a very white world. Um, and I would say, you know, he, I went to Eckstein, 
um, and ended up in at Roosevelt. And that was where I feel like I was I was truly understanding what it meant to be othered in a, in a white dominant society. Um, so two years after Eckstein and then two years at, at Roosevelt, I just felt like I couldn't really handle it anymore. Um, and so I decided to transfer to Garfield. And that was where I felt like I, I could really become myself and start to better understand, better unpack what it meant to be just me and um, to, to relate to other people who, who understood uh, the experience of being othered. Um, I, I don't want to go, I can't really do like the whole bio, but my my experience um, at Garfield took me actually to, to New York. And so I ended up going to a, a small liberal arts school across the country, um, Skidmore College, small, uh, 2,400 students. But what I learned there was a lot more around what it meant to be a, a student of color um, in a school that was predominantly white, but also being um, othered again because there weren't that many Asian kids for one, um, but mixed race kids especially, and then West Coast kids. So um, there were a lot of moments where actually, Leilani, your your book, um, Undercover Asian, really that the the just the term really stands out to me because I felt that I felt people making jokes about Asian people in front of me because they had no idea that I was Asian, um, or they they just they just assumed that it was a safe thing to, to do or to talk about. Um, I was a sociology psychology major also, Jessamine. I, I, I feel like I was all about sociology and that took me into education. Um, and so I graduated college um, thinking a lot more about urban education and thinking about, about how I could um, take my sociology, my love for social justice into the education world. I ended up working as a um, college admissions counselor, multicultural recruiter, um, which took me into college access, which got me a little bit more interested in college um, counseling with students, working with, with young people. I was um, a youth development coordinator, um, switched over to, to uh, working now as um, kind of a, a consultant to schools and school districts trying to figure out how to make um, advanced courses more equitable for, for students. Um, so I'm in Oakland, California, and I think the, the, the interesting thing for me today is just being in a historically black, black city um, and what it means to be a, a person of color, but also a non-Black person of color in a historically Black city, um, what it means to be mixed race in a, in a city that is incredibly diverse, um, and, and how to, to relate to other people. Because I, I think about my mixed race experience as, as being one of um, kind of bridges, you know, how to, how to bring worlds together and, and um, thinking a lot about how to connect with people that might look different than you, that that have very different lived experiences than you, but also recognizing that um, we're all coming into our, our collective spaces together with these with these such varied um, different lived experiences. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah, you've been around. <laughs> this is uh, uh, quite a story. Um, Teresa, Teresa Stovall, you're up, please. I'm up and hello everybody in one second, please. Okay, so. Well, I've got 70 years to cover, so I thought I'd do some show and tell. Can everybody see this? Everybody yeah. can see? Okay, cool. Let's go. My journey starts with my ancestors, the Jewish ones on the left, Black ones on the right, my brother and I in the middle. I come from people who survived constant oppression, injustice, and threats to their existence, and I work hard to represent them. My journey has been a quest for the perfect word or phrase to describe all the facts and facets of my identity, to quiet the constant questions and shut down the nonstop identity policing. Go back to the beginning in the 1950s with Jim Crow down south, de facto, de facto racism up north, before loving, before school desegregation, before black voting rights, I was born into a community of Seattle's black jazz musicians who married interracially and lived in the central area. It was easy to see that the world viewed me through a binary lens, but I knew I was the synthesis, the sum, the totality of my ancestry. So while I felt the pressure to choose, I fought hard to live my and in an either or world. And I got mixed messages. My parents divorced by now, had different, different approaches. My mom said, you must live your whole truth. My dad said, the way you look, you can be anything. And my friend said, you can't be black and Jewish at the same time. So I was navigating all of that. Of course, I went with my mom's wisdom, 
But then I had to figure out, how do you make that work? And um, I wasn't sure the world was ready for my messy truth. So coming into adolescence was even more complicated against the backdrop of the civil rights movement, the black power movement, women's liberation and protests against the Vietnam War. I hit adolescents trying to navigate racism in white spaces, colorism in black spaces and learn where the Jewishness fit into that whole maze. By my teens, I was integrating Roosevelt High School. The Black Panther Party took me under their wing and taught me to understand these isms from a global perspective. Mom made sure we learned yoga and meditation. So when I drew a black power fist on one leg of my bell-bottom jeans and a peace sign on the other, my friends dubbed me a black power flower child and they weren't wrong. In college, I found my voice and for the first time, publicly shared how I felt about being mixed through a poetic manifesto, Twilight Child. When it was published, I thought I'd be ostracized, but people liked it and said it helped them understand mixed people. My voice was unleashed and there was no turning back. In the late 70s, Seattle made national news when Jet Magazine came to cover a group of us lobbying hard for our own census box. And I longed for mixed spaces, conversations and fellowship, but that didn't exist back then. As a result, for most of my adult life, I've described myself as Black with a Jewish mom. Black was inclusive. I've always been culturally, socially, and politically African-American, and there still wasn't a mixed there. When we finally got that census box, I was interviewed with other mixed writers, including Walter Mosley, Stacey Ann Chin, and Matt Johnson, about our response to the box, and I explained why I couldn't check it. Boom, it's the mid 2000s and now there's a mixed there, public conversations, podcasts, festivals, conferences, and tons of affinity groups on social media. And to this day, most mixed people coming into these spaces say this is the first time I've been with people like me. It's a big deal. Also in the mid 2000s, my specific mix went from novelty to normative. We had black and Jewish music video and all the actors, singers, chefs, authors, and scholars coming out publicly as bluish. It's strange to be trendy, but muzzle to the tub, it's about time. Then my ancestors made me write my mixed memoir, Swirl Girl, Coming of Race in the USA, which came out in 2020. It's been well received, but the best part is knowing the power of story to reach, touch, and inspire others to share their stories. We need all the mixed voices we can get. Today, my ancestors have me blogging at Mixed Auntie Confidential, discussing all things mixed with Sir Auntie Maine on the award-winning Militantly Mixed podcast, and hanging out in the mixed there to learn, to serve, connect, and support other mixed voices, journeys, and truths while fulfilling my ancestors' wildest dream. Thank you. I mean, thank you. That was that was really colorful and interesting. And having read Swirl Girl, you know, I, I, it takes me back to the book. Um, so, Robin, you there? Thank you, everybody. Uh, now we get to the good stuff. Uh, Professor Nushime is going to lead the panel discussion with questions, and the rest of us will we'll um, mute ourselves. If you have a question, go ahead and put it into the chat. And there are several people who are monitoring, monitoring the chat, including um, Leilani, and we will get to you, so. Yeah, don't feel like you have to wait until the end to ask your questions. We can incorporate it as we go along. Um, so I guess I'd like to start by asking you all what you think is uh, are some of the common misconceptions about mixed race people. Uh, maybe ones that you've encountered yourself. I don't want to call on people. Does anyone want to just unmute? I don't mind calling on people though. Justin, can we start with you? 
Absolutely. I was about to go and click it too. Um, I would say one of the misconceptions about being uh, mixed is that you're not enough of either or, right? It's like you have to kind of navigate, like, what does it mean to be Black? Well, what does it also mean to occupy a white space? Um, and what does whiteness mean, at least in the context of myself? Um, just because I think a little bit more context can give, you know, some clarity to my words. On my mom's side, all of her family members went to college, they're white, they um, come from generational wealth. And on my dad's side, black, I'm actually the first college graduate and the only person who holds two degrees on that side of the family. Um, and so for me, it was just like, what does racial identity look like relationally, but also how does that also look like tangibly, right? Because sometimes that can change like where you live, how you engage, what activities you engage in. And so even when I was at Roosevelt and I served um, as a captain of the golf team, like I was the only black person on the team serving on a predominantly white, historically white sport to a degree. And so for myself, I think it was more so um, I can exist in both spaces and I can also show up in my fullness and I can also show up with some cute khakis that I got from Goodwill wearing these cute hoops that I got from, you know, uh, the nail salon. And so for me, it was having more confidence in myself, being able to occupy either space and also knowing that the world can't give me my identity. I'm the one who's, you know, has the opportunity to create it. And I get to listen to country music one second or Erica Badu the next. And so for me, it was less so getting approval from what the world would want to box me in as, or maybe if they only wanted me to speak at the MLK assembly, hashtag Roswell High School. Uh, and to me, actually, I would find other assemblies and me being able to branch out in different places. So I think, you know, not being enough is what the world tells you to be, but I am more than enough in my being. So that is what I would say. And I'm going to tuck it on over to our girl. Gotcha. I want to add, I, I think I want to, add to that and say that we could we can be like everything and nothing at all at the same time I know that sounds a little bit weird but um I feel like everything that you just said Jasmine I, I feel like I can be wholly Japanese I can be wholly American or white or whatever it is and 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 enjoy all the different aspects of my of my culture and my ancestors and my and my family but I also there's also this like another dimension that um is is none of that which is just like what it is to be mixed. Um, and so I think, you know, I, my family talks a lot about race and my dad, um, I think he understands, I'm just, I'm throwing my dad out there for a second, but I think he understands that um, his children are, are Japanese, his children are part white, his children are um, Asian, but I don't know if he completely understands that there's a, there's a, um, shared experience between my sister, my brother, and I that will not be um, something that uh, can be communicated clearly that's about either Japanese or white, if that makes sense. So it's just, it's, it's, there's very much this like mixed, collective mixed experience um, that I think is very special, unique. Um, and I can share that mixed experience with other people who are mixed who might not be the same mix as I. Um, so I don't know if that kind of um, adds or uh, maybe even confuses a little bit of what Jasmine is saying, but I feel like we can be everything and, and um, something completely different all at the same time. Quincy. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I totally can um, can echo that. Um, I also think, you know, um, it's really tough. I mean, to really, yeah, to what Teshko is saying. I mean, it's not just we're not just black and white or white and Asian. Or it's not like it's not like you're combining those two because what you're doing when you say that. And you don't acknowledge the stereotypes behind those those words is you're just you're making it easier for society a white society to categorize you and you're saying well you know this if this kid is mixed black and white then oh maybe they play, play basketball but maybe they play golf and so you're boxing you're still even though it's you know you got two options you're still boxing them in you're saying well and the reality is well what if they what if they play volleyball what if they play you know so it's you know using that as an analogy is kind of explains to me like um just what it is to to be mixed and trying to overcome expectations um when you know 
um, I would say a lot of the times white people don't have to consider their race and they just consider themselves, oh, well, I'm this and I'm that. Well, um, as mixed people, we have to confront the fact that we are mixed and that and that there's going to be differences when we're engaging our day to day stuff, when we're going to school, when we're going to work like we have to um, we have to acknowledge that difference. And so that's yeah, that's my piece. OK, so. Common mixed conceptions about mixed race people, one to build on what Quincy just said, that we can be understood from or relegated to a binary perspective. We can't. Um, also, that mixed people are an instant feel-good solution to racism. We're not. And that there is a right or wrong way to be mixed. So those are the some of the most common misperceptions that um, I'm seeing in the spaces I spend all day in. And you know, I've done a lot of surveys and polls with people as well, but those are all very popular ones. The, I kind of build on what everybody said before. Yeah, Tashika, it was kind of reminding me in, I think in Japan, uh, I was hearing that um, some of the mixed race people there were, were trying to change terminology right now, right? They call people who are um, mixed hafu, that they're half one and half the other. And um, there's kind of a movement to call them dabudu, to say that you're double actually. So you're not half one and half the other, you're actually double. Um, so I thought that was a really, it was a really interesting way to kind of push back against some of those, um, some of those stereotypes. So you um, actually, I've heard both Quincy and Tashika sort of start to answer um, uh, one of the other questions I had, which is that I wonder if you think there's something that, um, that unites mixed race people. Um, something, is there some sort of commonality uh, particularly across right different kinds of racial groups so I'm wondering if you think there is there is something called like a, a mixed race identity I can I can start us off and just I think one commonality and I'm sure there are many but one commonality is just the feeling maybe of the questioning of belonging um I think there's often a questioning of where do I belong? Do I belong? Um, or maybe even the opposite of, of saying, no, I belong everywhere. Um, but and, and I think that is maybe um, more of a self-empowered way to, to be. But I do think that one common experience is, um, whether it's good or not, is probably that a lot of us grow up wondering if we belong in a certain space or trying to find our place where we belong. So question of belonging. And then just hopping on in, um, Tashka, what you were talking about. I feel like when you enter into a space, it's like the references may change, but the systems are still the same, right? So when you mentioned earlier how people called you half and half, like my, you know, form of that was being called Oreo, you know, black on the outside, white on the inside. And so it's just like, as you occupy, whether it's Roosevelt High School, different generations, you graduate different years, it's different classmates, still generationally, there is that same kind of cultural, you know, just nagging and picking and probbing and telling you who you are and who you're not at the same time. So it's just kind of crazy how it, you know, it changes in regards to different ethnic backgrounds and racial backgrounds. But overall, it's like, again, it's like you are in a predominantly white system in a predominantly white school and predominantly white nation, right? And so again, it's like, you're always, you know, coming at it at this kind of like, you know, I don't know. I love what you said, um, or Tashka, where it's kind of like, it's a different dimension, right? So it's not just a black and white experience, not just, you know, Asian and Mexican experience. It's kind of like you are navigating a system where you don't belong in either category. And so I think I just went off on a little tangent there. But um, it just really much as I feel like the systems are the same, but the references look different. Um, so actually, there's a there's a couple questions in the chat that I'm hoping to get to, and, and there's a couple that seem similar to me. So Nadja Brown and Edward Corker um, ask questions that are, are kind of like variations, I think, on this question of how much control you have or how much um, how much volition do you have in determining your racial identity, right? So if you, um, I think one of the examples saying, if you think you're Black, are you Black, right? If you, if you sort of say, this is my experience, this is my identity, um, are you making a choice? Are you able to choose your racial identity? I 
can I just jump in? I didn't raise my hand, but just jump in. Um, I think that's a really interesting question, but um, you know, the the phrasing is a little bit um I guess to dice to to deconstruct that. Um if you think you're black, you are black. Right? I mean, that's the answer to that, right? If you think you're black, you are black. I mean, how if you if your experience as a live person is being black, everyone has the black people aren't one don't have one shared experience. We have the experience of racism. We have the experience of maybe some shared interactions. But yeah, if you think you're black, you're black. The the key part there is that, you know, people's appearance, particularly when we're talking about media, um, I know the, the another part of the question here, it says, um, you know, a movie, I'm not exactly sure, but in the media, you see the face and you see maybe the clothes they wear and you make a distinction based on that and you say, oh, they're black. And that's the easy way of doing it. You, you can do that but you're really not getting, you're not understanding who they are. You're just seeing how they look. Um, so that's that's my answer to that. So I'd like to um, respond to a couple of the questions in the chat together. So the question about if you think you're black or you're black was asked in regard to Rachel Dolezal, who is white and has made a career lying about being black. and. Um, so in that case, no, you're not black if you say you're black. In that case, she doesn't have any black ancestry. And the, you know, black identity, like uh, many other identities, is um, not necessarily um, one di one dimensional. It's very fluid. It's always political, right? It's always controversial. It's usually contentious, and it's it's often fluid in some ways in some situations. The movie we he asked about was passing based on Nell Lar Nell Larson's famous novel that was made into a movie a few years ago about a light-skinned black woman passing for white a hundred years ago. So in that case, she was a black woman, she was passing for white. Then, you know, so that was again a different situation. And she was not uh, in the book or the movie a mixed race woman, although the actress who played her was. So um Bigger picture, and I think Naja asked this, if you're asked, if you answer the question, what do you identify as are you choosing? Great question, very pertinent. I think that builds on the whole concept, and this is really, really hard. And I want to thank um, young folks, millennials, Gen Z, for getting us off of the gender and sexuality binary. Okay, that's the analogy I like to use. So when people talk about choosing in boxes, it's very, very hard in this country, in this culture, and in many others, not to look at a mixed race person and want to shoehorn us into a convenient slot or box, right? I mean, obviously, for in many cases, our very existence is disruptive, it's disquieting, it's uncomfortable, and it reminds people of things they'd rather not be reminded of. And, you know, there's all kinds of other things that go along with that. So when somebody says, I mean, everybody's at situation is, is specific and different. And so I, I can say I identify as Black, right? But A, I have Black ancestry, it's on my birth certificate. And B, I identify as Black. I don't deny anything else, but that's how I identify, right? Um, but again, that's a super fluid, super fluid um, dynamic. For most people individually, you've got people, siblings, full-blooded siblings who grew up in the same environment who identify racially and ethnically very differently from each other. That is not unusual. Um, and so just big picture, when you say I identify as, it can, it can be complex, if that makes sense. There can be nuances. You might identify with a culture that's not in your ancestry, but that you grew up around or that you just feel a really strong affinity for. There are mixed people who don't necessarily identify culturally with any of their ancestries, right? For a lot, for hundreds and hundreds of reasons. So I hope that kind of answers those questions. But in the case of Rachel Dolezal, we now have a term to describe what she does, which is called black fishing, which is pretending to be black and reaping the benefits of that when you're not black. So that, that's a firm no. Um, passing is a whole nother topic, but you know the fluidity of our identity 
it varies by individual. It varies based on so many things, generation, geography, phenotype, and everything else that that's why it's just a big old question mark that everybody's, including mixed people themselves are exploring these days. Yeah, I just want to I just want to jump on and say like the the part about how complex it is 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 like the biggest takeaway, right? Mixed race experience is insanely complex because it, nearly every single person's experience is completely different. Um, not just on like what you are, um, but also whether it's the language, whether it's culture, whether it's um, country, whether it's uh, city, right? It's, I, I think a lot about like intersectionality and everyone's experience is so different even within one race, but that's because of the different intersectionalities. So mixed race experience, it's almost like, um, more than twofold, more than, you know, it's, it's, it's bringing in all these different things that somehow do relate to race, but also might not be exactly race. So phenotype, language, um, culture, right? Like you could be mixed race, but not, uh, but be growing up in one culture that is very different than where your, your parent grew up in. Um, and so I think, I think the, the, the biggest takeaway is not just about the complexity of it all, but also that um, I do think to Naja's point, um, uh, the, or, or I, I think Natalia's point maybe around um, how how you identify, I think the giving mixed race people the ability to kind of choose their own identity. Someone might say, I'm this and this. Someone might say, I'm this. Um, someone might say, I'm none of that. I'm mixed. Um, so I think that's the, the part that is really interesting to me. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, sorry, I guess I'll jump in there. Um, yeah, I was not aware of the, uh, that I was very confused by the question. Sorry, I did not, I told that went totally over my head, but, uh, moving on, um, I see some stuff here. I see a question for me. And so how much did race and culture play a part in your college choice, um, versus what you're interested in studying? Um, that's interesting versus, I mean, um, I think it was both. I mean, going to uh, going to I visited Cleveland over spring break um, and I went on a run. I ran around the neighborhood just to see see what it was like. Um, I think it was, you know, it's very diverse. Um, you know, my first impression of it was it that it was diverse. And so I think I felt comfortable there, um, you know, comparing to I'm trying to think. I mean, obviously, so UW was an option. So you know, I know what you dubs like. Um, the other option for me was um, uh, University of Southern California. And so I didn't have a whole lot of time to actually visit there. Um, and we didn't actually go on a tour there. But, you know, their, their program is diverse. Um, but for me, I didn't feel LA didn't really feel right for me. Um, I don't think that was only in terms of uh, race and culture I think it was it was culture mostly I think just not really feeling I don't know it didn't feel right um and kind of the uh the attitude that USC had but I mean it's interesting to me about this question because for you know the choice I made it was based on the fact I wanted to study engineering in case Western is a great engineering school um but then also so yeah focusing mostly on that I would say but then you know, just ensuring that I will feel comfortable in that environment was also important. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I um, I thought that was a really interesting question too, partly because so many of the people on the panel, the, the ways that their racial identity um, developed or shifted over time, depending on their environments or where they were living. Um, I know that for my kids are, are mixed. And when we go to Hawaii, it's, they have a very different kind of relationship to their racial identity um, because they're recognized as being mixed race Asian sort of immediately in ways that they aren't in other kinds of environments. So I'm wondering if um, any of the other panelists would might want to talk a little bit more about that, like how um, particular spaces or places might um, encourage or discourage, you know, certain kinds of racial identifications. Absolutely, I can hop right on in. 
I would say um, when I first went to New Orleans, Quincy, you're doing a more thorough job than I ever did with my college search. I absolutely went on the Common App, just clicked every box that, you know, allowed me to submit an application for free. And then I actually decided on Lola just for two factors. One, I love the sociology department. And also, um, I just heard that New Orleans was such a friendly city. And so, again, culture is huge. And when you think culture, it's social behaviors, values, basically it's collective consciousness, right? So it's not just about being in a predominantly Black city like DC. It's actually like, how do people actually relate to one another, right? And so for myself, going down to New Orleans, it was just beautiful because I found my Black identity expanding in a way that I never saw before. I saw such a array of what it meant to be Black. And having grown up in 18 years in Washington State, I mean, I was good on the white exposure. And so going down to New Orleans, I remember Black Student Union, their first uh, year, like their theme of the year was Blackish. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Because again, like to be Black doesn't mean to live to the stereotypes. And I think that's um, a part of where people kind of ask you like, are you Black? Are you white? Like, what does it mean to be mixed? Because for them, it's easier to compute your existence when they can categorize you. But the reality is like, that's that's not who I am because Blackness can, again, be Black-ish. And so for myself, what I love about New Orleans is that gave me the confidence to go out dancing to like jazz music. And then when I go out dancing to Latin music into one second, you know, hanging out, which I would not recommend sending your kids to New Orleans for college. Open container laws do exist. And you know, you only to be 18 enter a bar. So a little too much fun, but hey, ride girl rolls are in effect. So what I loved is that I could really just like be a little social butterfly and occupy every space. So one second I am helping out with Mass of the Holy Spirit, writing an article for our newspaper. And the next second I'm sending my Saturdays in um, random churches helping a local coalition called Take Them Down Nola, right? We're removing Confederate monuments that may not represent the diversity of the city, um, or maybe were erected in a time period where it was, you know, to incite fear out of a monument rather than actually build culture, which we are now trying to rebuild in outer New Orleans. And so for me, it was um, just beautiful seeing just, you know, having that level of exposure, knowing that there was a different standard, um, and then being there for five years um, during undergrad and my master's program allowed that to become my standard of engagement. So even if I do go back to Seattle, Washington, there's still a standard, right? Relationally, culturally, even with myself. Um, so that's what I think exposure is just huge. For me, I think, um, and I'll try, I'll try to keep this short. I think I almost had a, a almost like an opposite experience being part Asian um, and moving to the East Coast because of just um, demographics. So I think going to a school on the East Coast, um, and I'm really generalizing here, but I think in a lot of ways, a small liberal arts school in the East Coast was, if they were recruiting Asian students, it was much more, uh, more often first generation Asian students on the East Coast um, than a Asian American experience or a mixed race Asian experience or um, kind of a little bit more of a, a, a complex, a co more complicated Asian background. Um, and so I think for a lot of folks on at least where I, what I was experienced on the East Coast was if you said you were Asian, there was a, um, a pretty quick assumption or generalization um, a kind of an image of what Asian meant, and that was East Asian from Asia, first generation, um, probably Chinese. Uh, there was a, there was a lot more um, assumptions that were being made, and it was a little bit harder to describe what the Asian experience could be like um, in in a place like Seattle, um, especially with such a huge Asian American history. So that was interesting for me, I think. Hopping back in, Tushka, you really bring up a point too, where it's like even within each of those identities, like you know, being Asian or being Black, there's also like levels to it. Like, um, like what actually culturally, like what cultural activities do you do that really solidify like your Blackness or like your Asian identity? Like, one thing I didn't realize that there is like this, you know, Black kind of um, no Black fraternities and sororities. I didn't realize that was a thing until I got down to New Orleans, and that played a huge part in how you engage in your cultural like identity and formation, right? Um, and so it is kind of crazy 
about even how people begin to categorize you, even within that aspect, there's levels and layers to it of like, even within black culture, how black are you? Even within Asian culture, like what kind of Asian are you? First generation, are you Asian American? And that can radically shift again, your whole experience geographically from West Coast to East Coast, South to Seattle. Um, so that's just one little, you know, little connection that got in my head. And, and for me, it really connects with what you all were saying earlier about this, you know, how much do you choose, right? Do you get to choose your racial identity? I mean, I think, you know, part of it is, is only if you can imagine that there's no society, right? I mean, there's a whole world around you that's limiting your choices or sort of dictating your choices. And even if you're choosing not to follow those, those restrictions, you're still being formed, right? By the kind of larger society, those larger social beliefs. Um, I, I thought uh, maybe we could answer this question too. And if this is from um, Natalia, what advice would you give to parents of mixed children? I'll go with a tough one. I might be the only person on the panel who's raised kids. <laughs> I don't know. My kids aren't mixed, by the way, but or they weren't raised mixed. They don't identify as mixed. But I spend again a lot of time in mixed spaces. The general advice I'll give advice, then I'll give a referral. Um, the general advice I would give because my mother did such an incredibly amazing job is that whatever as parents whatever your culture is race ethnic culture nationality language just put it all into the box of culture share that with your child if you're if you don't have geographic access to it, you have the internet nowadays so there's no excuse but share that as proudly and as directly even if you don't know a whole lot about it share the culture you come from because that makes up part of your child so that they feel very closely connected to and rooted in that culture. Whatever they decide to do, quote unquote, choose to do later on is a whole nother thing. But that really, I think that is the single most important thing. The other thing for people with young children, or if you're having mixed kids and you haven't, they haven't had them yet, and there is a layer of privilege uh, involved in this, but if there's any way you can raise them in an environment where they're reflected, in a diverse environment where there are other people of their mix, Again, my mother did that. Um, it is the single most important empowering thing you can do. I realize not everyone can do that. The third is for mixed parents, um, look up Dr. Jen Two Ends Noble. She's a mixed race woman, black and Sri Lankan. Her psychotherapist full-time work is working with parents and mixed kids. She is beyond brilliant. And I recommend her without reservation to people every single day. Dr. Jen Two Ends Noble, look her up. I haven't raised children myself, um, but I know what it's like to be raised um, by parents. So I think um, to add on to that, so there's, and, and there's a question in the chat that that had to do with um, raising um, uh, tra transracially adopted um, kids. I can't remember, I can't see, I, I don't, I can't find the, the exact question, but I, I was thinking a little bit around how, um, encouraging embracing is so important and um so really it's echoing what Teresa was saying but how much can you ensure that your child is learning all the things and it might not be what exactly it looks like to be this person but allowing them to be exposed to as much as possible so that they can start to form their own identity and their form their own understanding of their racial identity um, and making space for it to be complicated and messy. Um, I will admit that I have um, been told that I'm acting too American or that I need to be more Japanese, right? And I think that has caused um, a lot of tension and trauma in my own life trying something or not being too much of something else. And so really making space for your child to, to explore, to be themselves, um, but really to expose them to as much as possible so that they can make that choice later in life. Yeah. And even building off the I feel like I'm just hitching onto your wagon. Like every few seconds, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's totally great. Um, it's like, if you don't know what to do as a parent, hold space. 
Like again, I've been um, a child or I haven't raised a child, but it's a matter of um, when you don't know what to do, allow your child to come to their own conclusion, right? And I can have a story moment with my mother. She is predominantly, or she's white. And so with her, it was during like the George Floyd era when I was just so internally frustrated. And so I, you know, I feel like even when you come into like, you know, what race, uh, not what, what does race mean to you as a mixed person? I just felt myself being very angry and didn't know how to deal with that frustration. And whenever I tried to communicate to my mom where I was, she would kind of want to have a conversation. And there were some moments I was like, mom, this isn't a moment that I need do you to have a conversation because the way that I'm internalizing this information about George Floyd versus the way that you're internalizing this experience of George Floyd, two completely different experiences. And it's hard for my mom because it's a white woman. It's like, she views me as her daughter. She's like, who would ever want to hurt my baby girl? Why would anyone want to be racist? Like that is the girl that I love, that I raise. And so while she doesn't see me for my race, the way that I walk through the world is completely different, right? And so that's where we can enter the same room and have two different experiences even though we're carbon copies of each other. We literally crack a joke. I'm like, we're the same person. I'm just a little tall, a little darker. And so, um, so again, when you don't know what to do, hold space. You don't have to, especially not project your thoughts or your opinions of race onto your child as theirs is still forming. And so again, go back to exposure, go back to allowing them to be frustrated and to also sit in that tension. Sometimes parents, I feel like are fast and want to get a solution, make sure they're little nugget is okay and the reality is it's like you are just an advisor right like you can tell your kid you know hey do this do that but they're going to make their own decisions and so it's like how do you really as a parent give them the tool of ownership how do you give them exposure how do you tell them who they are in the world tells them who they're not there are multiple instances at roosevelt i almost got spelled three times one for leading a walkout one for doing something else and so in those moments it's like when the principal would be like hey we think this is excessive moment, or let me actually break it down a little more simpler uh, or simplify it. There was a moment I let a walk out. It was 2014, the Ferguson decision. I did not feel like uh, going to school that day was a possibility for me. Um, I didn't feel like I could sit down in class with knowing what was going on outside those walls. And so I ended up running around to every single classroom and said I was making an announcement for ASR and actually told people to meet me on the field at 1045. Uh, and so after we had a walkout, about a quarter of the school came out. Um, I was like, let's take it to the streets because why stop now? Walked to Red Square and that ended up kind of sparking multiple walkouts throughout the city of Seattle, which again is all part of constructing a conversation. And so at the end of the day, the principal then um, called my mom and said they were going to execute, you know, some disciplinary actions. And my mom said, um, did you call the other participants' parents? Are they also going to receive the same treatment? Okay, cool. So don't call me back again until you want to actually have a conversation about why the students walked out. And she was a white woman. So for me, she became an advocate in that moment. So as a parent, you are going to have to navigate all these nuances of how do you show up? How do you share space? At one point, you're going to have to be the advocate. At one point, you're going to have to just simply lead by listening. And also, again, what is your part um, behind closed doors? You can't always process your thoughts out with your children. That is not fair to them. And you have to kind of, you know, what is it like to occupy? Like my mom had those conversations outside of just me. And she had to do her research, not just sit down, read a book, read a podcast, but she had to actually sit and self-reflect of how do I actually show up for my kids and the ways that they need to be, like they need me to show up for, you know what I mean? I'm not just in the way that, you know, I think is right or I think is proper. To be a parent means to live above yourself um, and to prioritize your children and their needs. So that is my TED talk for the day. Um, having not raised a kid, but you know, having been raised, um, by an amazing white woman named Holly Wright. Um, so there's actually a, a kind of a follow-up question here in the chat. Um, and so Karen asks, how did your parents react to racism aimed towards your families? And how did that reaction shape you over the years? for me, I didn't want to steal the mic for a second. Um, how did my family react? Um, completely different ways. So on my mom's side, she's white. Um, and so for her, she just kind of had a lot of empathy. Like she was just like, 
oh, my heart's so, I'm just so sad and I'm so sad and I'm so sad and I'm so sad. And my dad's side, whenever, you know, anything would come up in the news or in politics or just, you know, life, uh, it was more so, again, even with him, there's so many different responses from the black community about when like racial tension arises in the US. Some people are like, you know, yeah, black people need to pull themselves out of their straps or this is like, you know, self-inflicting. And other people are like, no, this is actually a symptom of a system that doesn't work. And so my dad's response, um, not being reflective of the overall, like, you know, black experience in the US, he was just more like this like righteous anger kind of guy. And so he was just really upset. And so they're both upset. She's emotionally distraught, doesn't know how to respond. And he's like, this is what we need to do. And so that just created conflict, you know, being like the little middle nugget here in a way where it was like, I don't know how to respond. Should I be sad? Should I go start a rally? Should I try and have a conversation with everybody on 23rd and Jackson? Or should I just cry? Like, it was just so much to navigate where at some point um, I had to literally not look at my parents for a response. And it kind of was this sad reality that you had to grow up on your own in a way where it's like, you have to come to your identity and like, what does that mean for you? And what is the best way for you to respond? outside of just the racial construct, right? So if I'm sad, I'm sad. If I want to have a conversation, I can have a conversation about what does racial equity look like or kind of like not do these perfunctory things that would, you know, be required by either side, but really just like, how how are you feeling, Jessamine? What is the best way for you to express your frustration? Like within the Black community, some people express their frustration by being an organizer. Some people do it by poetry. And that's the part where I kind of use that movement analogy where in any social movement, people have different roles. And so for me, it's like getting, like as I'm figuring out what works best for me and what my role is whenever an issue arises or a social problem is, you know, existing, it was a matter of, okay, like what works best for me as an individual, um, as Jessamine Reichman. Um, and then that allowed me to show up more fully in circumstances that were, you know, tense. So that is my follow-up that I answered your question effectively. Well, it was actually a question for the whole panel. So if anybody else, yeah, if anybody else has a response. Um, so then let me ask another question that's in the um, that's in the chat. And so uh, uh, Rebecca is asking, um, I've never been asked, what are you? But my children are asked often, how much explaining should they feel obligated to offer? Um, and so this is maybe about her children, but maybe you could also talk personally, how much explaining do you offer um, and how do you decide? You could write a book about this question. There, and I'm sure there are books about this question. Um, I think how much should they feel obligated to offer? Zero, none. Um, if they want to, great. If they feel comfortable, great. Um, I think the question itself, how I feel about that question is um, in it, inherent in it is this question of like, you don't look like you belong. So let me try to like what Quincy was saying earlier, let me try to put you in a box because it's going to make me feel a little bit better. Um, and that's what is, I think, behind that question, even if someone has the best of intentions. Um, so I would, I would encourage folks to not require your child to answer it in any specific way, but the way that they're most comfortable and the way that they feel like they identify. And that might be, you know, that this question itself, it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> I think that, well, for me, the what are you and all the variations, where are you really from, where are your parents from, where are you born, blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the frequency and intensity of that has to do, this is my bias, with how racially ambiguous looking you are. And since I am extremely racially ambiguous looking. I encounter it every day, everywhere in the world from every human being I encounter. I thought I'd age out of it, but I didn't. I did, in fact, write my book to answer the question. So now I can say, hey, listen, well-written book. You'll like it five stars. Go get it. You, everything you want to know. But on the real, it is everybody. It is every human interaction everywhere in the world for me. And so how I answer it, I gave some in the slideshow. I answered that a bit. 
um, I answer it based on many things. Some of it's my mood, my energy, the person who's asking me, the context of the question, how much of a microaggression I think it is. It all falls, it falls under the umbrella of what I call identity policing. Um, very rarely is it simple, benign, curious question. People, and listen, we all do it. I'm not going to front. When you come across somebody who you can't identify, your brain starts doing this. Okay. I've done it. My kids have done it. They're ambiguous looking. It's human nature to do it. Just like we used to do with gender before we had more expanded options, right? Think about it like that, especially if you're of an elder generation. But so people do it. It's a natural thing to do. But when you're on the receiving, when your entire life is on the receiving end of it, 100% of the time, um, you know, in my family, there's a lot of us who are ambiguous and we talk about it. Um, for a long time, I would tell people to guess. And in my life, two people have guessed correctly, right? Two people have guessed correctly. Nobody ever guesses anything near. Guesses depend. They tell me where you've lived and traveled. They tell me. But, um, you know, so that's the, so that the language, I choose language based on all those things. And then sometimes I just like to mess with people's minds. I'm not going to lie, but I never, I never say anything other than what I actually am. You know, I, I got, I get a lot of criticism for that. Um, but I never, I never say anything other than what exactly specifically I am. And a, a lot of people, I've had people who think I'm what they are, argue with me and sometimes even get violent. So it's, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing, but that's if you're ambiguous looking. And I think sometimes, you know, it really depends on level of amb visual ambiguity and the environment. I've been in environments where people just think I'm black. And I've been in environments where people think I'm every other thing from almost every other continent, including you know Asia, South America, and whatever. That's a long answer, but the what are you is, it's a big deal. And it's a big deal for mixed people because nobody teaches you what your options are. So my thing is, you're right, Kishka, you can ignore it or whatever, unless it's a government official you're in an airline. I mean, I'm just giving you all my experience. You, you could be in an airport. It could be a cop. Like there's times when you just got to be like, la, 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 you know, and you can't get cute with it or play games with it or whatever. And you still might need to be strategic in your answer because it could be life or death. It's not always that dramatic, but it could be. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I just... It actually connected to what uh, Teresa was saying about the airport. Um, and generally, <laughs> when you're in lines, I mean, like a lot of the times, I'm sure that maybe you guys can share, share this experience, but like when it's just my mom or just my dad and it's me and my sister walking, like people will cut you off. People will, you know, they'll take my, like they'll take the airport uh, attendant or whatever, or like take my mom's uh ticket and be like okay well, where, are you, where are you guys where are your where's your ticket um so just like small things like that I mean I'm I feel fortunate to you know hearing some of these stories I haven't had um some of those uh more severe experiences so I feel grateful for that but um yeah I was asked if I was a nanny more than once when I was out with my kids when they were little Jessamine, did you want to add something? You don't have to. I was just wondering. I just said yikes to the part when people said that you were the nanny. I was like, oh. So <laughs> that was by just a initial response. Um, and actually, I had had I'd heard, um, I have a friend who's, whenever she's asked, she always asks a question back. She's like, well, why do you want to know? Um, and so she said, it, it can get actually get some pretty interesting responses from people um, when she kind of pushes back. You know, sometimes they're like, I'm just curious. And so she'll, well, why are you curious? Um, and so often it'll, it'll be more of a conversation that isn't about her trying to like, you know, what have solved their curiosity. Um, so I was also wondering, um, I'm a, a media scholar, so I was wondering if uh, you all have come across any good representations of mixed people in the media? Um, and if not, what kinds of rep representations would you like to see? I can start because I'm a media person too. Um, so the best representations for me, and most of them are very recent. They're maybe the last 
15-ish years. Before that, I've never seen any that are good, just FYI. <laughs> um, the best representations for me are those that are created and controlled by mixed people. Um, recent example, and it's a brand new series, limited series on Hulu called Unprisoned. It's written uh, by Tracy McMillan, a biracial woman, and the showrunner is Yvette Lee Bowser, also a biracial woman. So they get it really good. It, they do a really good job. They get it close to right. So Unprisoned on Hulu, I would say. Um, Carrie Washington plays the main character. They don't say whether she's biracial. She's playing the one based on Tracy McMillan, but her son is. And so they get a lot of things right. And it's in Minneapolis where my parents are from. So it has really accurate Minneapolis nuances as well um, in terms of race mixing and all that kind of thing. Um, Charlie Bordelon West on Queen Sugar was really the first really great representation I saw played by Don Leon Gardner, um, of course, created by Ava DuVernay. Uh, but Charlie Bordelon West was the best for a long time. A way, a, back a few years, Bell, a movie based on a true story. The, um, and that's the name of the movie was good. Gugu Mbatha Ra played the title character of Bell, and that was good. Nonfiction, everybody should watch the Hulu. I don't work for Hulu. The Hulu series 1619 Project. Nicole Hannah-Jones, who I'm sure you all know. If you don't, you should. Pulitzer Prize winner and MacArthur winner and everything else. Um, created the 1619 Project at the New York Times, and it has several iterations. One is a fabulous, I think it's six-part documentary on Hulu, and she narrates it. She's biracial, and she weaves in her family history throughout. So it's a brilliant way to really synthesize the, her, her experience. She's a historian as well as a journalist. So I really recommend that. And then the last one, um, well, second to the last one, Trevor Noah. His memoir, Born a Crime, sets the standard for the entire planet. And the last one is tomorrow, starting on HBO, comedian W. Kamau Bell has produced a documentary. He has three mixed daughters. It's called 1000% Me Growing Up Mixed. It debuts tomorrow, May 2nd, on HBO. I can't vouch for it, but you should check it out. <laughs> I love, I love W. Kamau Bell. So I bet it's going to be great. Um, and the Born of Crime, if you check it out from the library on the audiobook, he actually reads it himself, which is amazing. So it's definitely, I would definitely recommend that. How about some of our other panelists? Does that mean that there aren't any good? <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> there are. Um, I would say for myself, it's kind of a mixture of both. Like I'm actually not really too big on TV or um, and so for me, I feel like a lot of my learning comes from just like exposure. Uh, and so kind of like occupying spaces that aren't specifically tailored to mixed people, but just like being myself, like going to Pachata dance class right off of Roswell Avenue provides me so much more exposure. I'm like, this is great to learn just like in that capacity. But if it would be related to media, I would say this is actually one for you, Quincy, is Grownish. It's a spinoff of Blackish, and it's about Zoe, who, outside of just the role that she plays, Yara Shadid, she is, I believe, half Iranian and half Black. And so, with her perspective that she brings, just to, I think she also is like one of the producers, um, it just kind of creates this beautiful storytelling of like Gen Z. Um, college kids trying to navigate predominantly white institution, but their friends also culturally diverse. So I just love that because that was a lot more digestible in a really fun, humorous way. Um, so that would be like one of my recommendations I would have if you're trying to, you know, pluck the mixed identity conversation to someone in their 20s. Thanks for that. I'm sorry, I forgot Ginny and Georgia on Netflix. So Ginny and Georgia. There, it's it's a drama, um, and but the character Ginny is is mixed race, um, and I would say they get it pretty much right. I'm not sure who's in the writers' room because I obsessively research these things for a living, but I'm not sure if there's mixed people in the writers' room. But they do get the character of Ginny pretty much right, and I feel like she feels authentic. What do y'all think? I know y'all watch Ginny and George, right? I'll say it's juicy, um, if anything, <laughs> at that fact. <laughs> so, but it is, uh, I would say, pretty accurate to just like having that mixed identity and even being like in colorism in the world that that plays and how it comes off as like, how presenting are you? So how much do you actually embrace your culture? And also the reality too that I love about Ginny and Georgia 
is um, that's what my mom and I we drink wine and watch together and it's really funny because my mom's white and the daughter's black and I'm like oh my god you're white and I'm black this is great and so like Martin's dream in reality but I, what I love about that is um it's just amazing how it shows also the depiction of Ginny's dad not being in the picture but still being in the picture and the mom being like you know pursuing another partner getting remarried and the implications that that house now that Ginny has two white parental units in the house um because again social dynamics matter and partners matter that your parents choose and all that can contribute and also even her younger brother is like white because it also shows the diversity of like hey if you have like a half sibling what does that experience look like so that is kind of a very raw just chef's kiss to the chaos that it can be um for the beautiful chaos creative chaos that'd be mixed i, I want to just throw out there that in because in Ginny and georgia 100 percent, i think for me is a show that really centers like the mixed race experience you know it, it really is about that and it is about her experience um, trying to navigate these different worlds and not feeling enough of something and always, you know, having a, a foot in different worlds. Um, I think for the Asian American or mixed Asian experience, I feel like, um, and maybe I just don't watch things enough, but I feel like, I feel like as a racial group, we have been, the Asian <laughs> racial group, we have been fighting really hard to just get representation, period. Um, and so I I struggled with this question because I, to be honest, I can only name like um, the, the the series on, um, I think it's called To All the Boys I've Ever Loved Before, um, which was really a great movie, great multiple movies. Um, and they just normalized a mixed race family, um, Asian, Asian mom and white dad. Um, but didn't, I don't think they really dove into it much the way that Ginny and Georgia does. Um, but I think there's something beautiful about that in and of itself, because uh, when I watched that, I was like, oh, this feels, this feels like what my family feels like without having to kind of um, dive into it as much. It was a feel good movie, um, but I got to see a family dynamic that was more similar to mine. Yeah, I think there might also be more in books um, than maybe in television or film. Um, I just finished reading a book called Speak Okinawa, which is a memoir uh, of a girl who's um, half Okinawa. I bought that for my dad, actually, and he he's sending it my way so I could, I could read it. Yeah, get out your handkerchiefs. It's really, <laughs> it's, it's really moving. It's a great book, and she's a beautiful writer. So uh, let me move on to our last question then, uh, which is if you had advice you'd want to give to um, young mixed race people, uh, what would that advice be? And Quincy, maybe as our youngest <laughs> person, can we start with you? Um, well, I was, I don't know. I mean, to people younger than me, I mean, I still feel like I'm pretty young, but um, um I would say, I mean, for me, it was really just, it still is. I mean, it's a struggle just feeling, uh, you know, I mean, just talking about like the media representation, it's hard to feel like you're yourself. It feels like kind of disconnected. It's like, maybe I shouldn't be here. So I guess just giving reassurance that you are supposed to be there um you are supposed to be you know in every space you inhabit like you belong there there's a reason you're there um and you know but also being aware of the fact that you have to actively like you know seek out media and that's something I'll uh, start doing because I haven't been doing that um but you know it does feel like when I'm just scrolling through YouTube or scrolling through Instagram it's like there's no one looks like me like it's it's really tough and I know you know it's you know, increasing the increasing prevalence of social media, it's going to become, you know, that much, that much harder in that space for mixed people to find their identity. So, um, yeah, I would just say you belong. Quincy, real quick, mixed talk. Mixed people have taken over a big slice of TikTok. I don't want to send you down the rabbit hole, but just like there's Black Twitter, mixed talk is a thing. And it is a huge 
global mess, but it's fascinating and brilliant and really exciting. So hit up the mix folks on the tickety tots. For real. For real. Um, I would say to, to young people, um, your journey is your own. You are the boss of your identity. Don't let anybody police your identity ever, including your parents. Sorry, parents including your grandparents, including your siblings, because this is a real thing and they don't have the right to tell you. They can make suggestions, maybe, but I'm not even a fan of that. I really don't think they should be part of it. It's your journey. There is no right or wrong way to be mixed. And I encourage young people to unapologetically embrace their and because your and, however you define it, and all the ways you define it throughout your journey is seriously your superpower. I can hop on in. Um, I love that, Anne. I'm gonna get tattooed right here. Um, I would say the best thing, the best advice I would give to someone who's mixed race would be ownership. There is power in your narrative and there's power in just you being you. Um, and I feel like sometimes as you're growing up, people want to like, you know, bring all their conversations to you, right? Like, what is your perspective on this? What's your take on that? How do you feel about this? Do you identify as that? And you can literally be bombarded with questions and you're like, you know what? That is a great question. And I don't have the answer to that because you're still forming your identity. And, um, as Teresa said, she is still forming her identity. You know what I mean? It doesn't stop, but you have to go to the foundation. The foundation is ownership. That's what you allow, what you don't allow. You can't change someone, like change how someone treats you, but you can change how they, you know, receive you. Or actually, let, let's actually pass on that thought. But anyway, so ownership, that's what I would say. Um, and Quincy, it's okay if you don't have the answers. You, no one has all the answers. Um, you're not expected to perform for any person. And I would say before you even want to talk about relational or like, you know, racial equity, start with relational equity. Who are you? What do you like to do on a Saturday? How do you wake up in the morning? What kind of TV do you watch? Do you like watching golf? Or you don't like watching golf. You like playing basketball? Okay, sure, whatever. Like literally, who is Quincy? That's the essential question. Um, that's the question I would pose to any other person who's mixed race. Like, who are you? Tell, tell me who you are before the world tells you who you are. Yeah, I want to, I just want to, piggyback off of all of it I think it's it's really about um just being you and owning you and being okay with fully embracing all of you um whether that's racially whether that's ethnically whether that's culturally whether that's personality just being allowed to be you and know that there's a, a space for you even if even if at times it feels like you don't belong that actually the power that we have is that we get to be in so many different places at once and I also think that the power that we have in um the struggle is or the struggle of of wondering if we belong is is this ability to make stronger connections I I think I have um an ability to 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 be in multiple spaces and to be able to connect multiple people because I've had to navigate multiple worlds. Um, and that has allowed me to to be in places that feel uncomfortable and to lean in th into that discomfort. And so I guess I guess it's also just like lean into the discomfort, which I is something I would say to everyone, but um especially for for us who those who are mixed I think it allows us to to kind of um be more fully ourselves and to be almost um, prouder with who we are because we're allowing ourselves to lean into that and and to um, connect with others along the way oh, that's lovely thank you so much um yeah and thank you so much to all the panelists I think Robin were you going to yes um uh, we do have a short little survey that we would like everyone to, to take. And Quincy's going to lead us through that because, you know, I don't know how. And okay, then we'll so, start. Yeah, so I just posted the, um, the link to the survey in the chat. Um, it's just a short little survey. You can put your email in there if you want to. I'm not sure what's, does someone from where want to explain what the email's for? I'm not sure what so, <laughs> so thank you. Um, we wanted to do this survey so that we can build on this and make our next 
our next event, bigger, better, um, more applicable to everybody. This is the first one we've had in a long time. And so we're in kind of a reboot mode. I think you guys were amazing. So if you can do that survey, that would help us a lot to make sure that our future, our future events are on track and, and uh, we would love to know what else you'd be interested in doing. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. If you're interested in learning more about RARE, please visit the website because we are always looking for people to uh, volunteers to um, join us. And we're always looking for people who are interested in helping to move the needle forward in terms of racial equity. So there are lots of places for you to land, hopefully softly, and we will help you do that. Um, many, many thanks to our speakers. They have invested a lot of time and a lot of heart into this and it shows. I thought you were all stellar. So thank you so much for sharing your experiences and opening yourselves up to all of us. Uh, I do think it's significant that at the, the most we had 41 people and at 7.21, which was only 10 minutes before ending time, we still had 38. So that to me says a lot that people were hanging in there. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good night. <laughs>